here on Democracy Now! and democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. In a Massachusetts school, 73 disabled children were spoon-fed oatmeal laced with radioactive isotopes. An upstate New York hospital, an 18-year-old woman, believing she was being treated for a pituitary disorder, was injected with plutonium. At a Tennessee clinic, 829 pregnant women were served vitamin cocktails, they thought, but they contained radioactive, radioactive iron as part of their regular treatment. No, these are not acts of terrorism by common criminals. These are just some of the secret human radiation experiments that the U.S. government conducted on unsuspecting Americans for decades as part of its atom bomb program. In a gruesome plot that spanned 30 years, doctors and scientists working with the U.S. Atomic Weapons Program exposed thousands of unwilling and unknowing Americans to radiation poisoning to study its effects. For years, the experiments by the U.S. government and identities of their human guinea pigs were covered up. After a six-year investigation, reporter Eileen Wilson uncovered the identities of 18 people who were injected with plutonium in the 1940s without their knowledge by federal government scientists. Eileen Wilson published her findings in a series in the Albuquerque Tribune and received the Pulitzer Prize for her work. It took another six years for her to complete her book. It's called The Plutonium Files, America's Secret Medical Experiments in the Cold War. She joins us now in Boulder, Colorado. Eileen Wilson, thanks for joining us. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Over the years, we have spoken with you, but now that we're on this tour and you live in Denver, this is a rare opportunity to sit down and go through this story. First, how did you even get a clue that this was going on? Uh, Amy, it started, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I was a reporter at the Albuquerque Tribune, and I was... Um, doing some research on an Air Force base there. Uh, they were doing some cleanup uh, work. And I noticed that uh, in the document there were several radioactive animal dumps uh, on this Air Force base. So I was curious about uh, what kind of animals were in the dump and why were they radioactive. So I went o over to the Air Force base, Kirtland Air Force Base, um, to what was then called the Air Force Special, Special Weapons Laboratory. And they got out a big stack of these dusty reports for me to read on these animal studies. And so as I was thumbing through these reports, um, it was horrible because they were intubating beagles and watching them uh, develop cancers and how long they lived and charting the radiation sickness. But uh, as a reporter, there wasn't a story there for me. These were old experiments, and as gruesome as, as gruesome as they were, it wasn't something that a daily newspaper would be interested in. So it was about 5 o'clock on Friday. I was eager to go home. But I felt like I had gone to this trouble to get these documents, and I had to make my time there look good. So I kept flipping through uh, the reports, and my eye fell on a footnote. And the footnote mentioned something about 18 humans who had been injected with plutonium. So I kind of reared back in my seat. I was just shocked um, to think that our government had injected 18 people with plutonium. So I jotted down what I could from the citation, and the next day, uh, which was a Saturday, I went to the university library there and started hunting up uh, reports about these scientists. So that was, that was the very beginning of it. And the reason I looked at the footnote, I, always, I, I, I need to say this, is that I had done a lot of financial reporting prior to that time, and I, I know that whenever uh, a company wants to put in the bad news, it's always in a footnote. 
So that taught me to look at footnotes. And so how did you begin to unravel the story? Well, here was my problem. Um, I learned there were some scientific reports in the, in the literature, um, but these people, so I got those reports, I started to cull everything I could, um, and, I, and I learned that there were 18 people that had been injected with plutonium, um, but they were known by code numbers only. So the problem for me became how to find 18 Americans that had been injected with plutonium 30 or 40 years ago in a country of millions. So um, I thought that it would, I, I mean, it was an impossible task. And um, so I started very, very crudely. I, I put these 18 code numbers on yellow sheets of paper. And then as I gathered documents, I would write down what I knew about each of these 18 people. So I eventually learned their ages, the date they were injected, uh, what kind of disease they had, um, if there was an autopsy or a biopsy conducted, and when they died. And, um, and then, um, and then, um, and then it, was just, it was just a matter of, of continuing to do that and pick up clues. Tell us about um, one of the 18 people. Well, I had gone off on a journalism fellowship and I had been filed, filing Freedom of Information Act requests with the federal government. So I had a tiny folder on this experiment. And when I came back and looked, I pulled out my folder and I kind of maybe had fresh eyes. And I looked um, at this document again. And, my, and, and these documents were redacted. In other words, the names of the patients were whited out and so, so were the names of the doctors. And my eye fell on this line which said, uh, physician so-and-so, or excuse me, doctor so-and-so contacted the physician of Cal 3 in Italy, Texas. And what leapt out at me were the words Italy, Texas. And by then, I knew a lot about Cal 3. I knew he was an African-American man who would have been 80 years old, who would have been, um, uh, who had his left leg amputated three days after he was injected with plutonium. And so given that, that given those few clues, and that this person might have lived in Italy, Texas, I was determined to go there and knock on every door till I found this man. We're talking to Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Eileen Wilson. Uh, so tell us about uh, your discovery, how you made contact. Um, so I, uh, I got out a map. Um, I looked up Italy, Texas. It was south of Dallas, about 60 miles. I called directory assistance, uh, got the number for Italy City Hall, called them up, introduced myself, described the person I was looking for, and they said, you're looking for Elmer Allen, but he died a year ago. Would you like his wife's number? So I, I said, of course, and I wrote the number down, and within minutes I was talking to Mrs. Allen. And what did you say? I was very circumspect because I didn't want to frighten her, and I didn't want to seem like a kook, and I also didn't want to put words in her mouth. I wanted to know what she remembered. So I just simply said that, you know, I had some documents that suggested that her husband may have been involved in a, a government-funded study, and I would like to talk with her about it. And she, it, she, said, she asked me to talk to her daughter, Elmarine Allen Whitfield, and I called Elmarine, and Elmarine was um, very quiet on the phone as I reeled out my story, and then she said, okay, you can come on. And so I flew to Italy, Texas, and we sat down at Elmarine's kitchen table, and by the end of the interview, I knew, and they knew, that I had found the first of these 18 people. Elmer's story? Elmer's story. What was Elmer's story? How did he end up in a hospital being injected with plutonium? Elmer was a railroad porter. 
he and his wife were living in the Bay Area in 19 in the mid 1940s. They had gone out. They had left Texas. They had gone out there to start a better life. They had two young babies. Um, Elmer fell from a train in Chicago and damaged his leg, and that sort of put him into the medical system. That was the beginning of uh, of of his. Uh, participation in this experiment and his leg did not heal and he uh, he kept going back to the doctor and somehow he found himself in this clinic at uh, UC San Francisco University of California Hospital in San Francisco and they selected him for this uh, uh, radiation experiment and um, they but he didn't know that he they oh no no him. he absolutely did not know um, um, he was told that he had an osteogenic sarcoma in his knee and that they were going to have to amputate in order to save him. There's some question about whether he did or didn't have that cancer, and I do not know the answer to that. But three days before they amputated that leg, they injected him in the calf intramuscularly with plutonium. Didn't he describe to his wife how they sort of put a target on his leg and they injected it in the middle of that? They um, uh, uh, eventually, uh, with uh, the consent of Mrs. Allen, I was able to get Elmer's medical records from UC San Francisco, and in those medical records, the doctors talked about putting that target on his calf prior to the injection. Now, he never knew he was a subject in a U.S. government experiment, but he suspected something. Is that right? Yes. Um, he told a good friend of his in Italy, Texas, that the doctors kept flying in and out of his room um, practicing to be doctors. And um, he told his friend, they guinea pig me. I kn he, you know? We interviewed Elmerine Allen a number of times, and she talked about how growing up her father would say that. And then when she was leaving for college, he said, watch out, uh, don't let the U.S. government guinea pig you. And they always thought, well, Elmer had some kind of, you know, he was sort of quirky, and he had this delusion that the government had experimented on him. It, uh, it, the, the sad part about, uh, and the tragic part about Elmer's story is that nobody believed him. Um, he went to his doctor and told him, you know, I think I've been injected with something. His doctor uh, diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic at the same time that he was conversing with the atomic energy scientists in Argonne National Lab to provide them with uh, uh, tissue samples. And wait, wait, wait. His doctor said he was a paranoid schizophrenic at the same time his doctor was providing Elmer's tissues to the government scientists that, doing the experiment? That's correct. That's what the medical records show. So um, Elmer was not only used at, in 1947 when he was injected with this uh, uh, radioactive isotope, but he continued to be used as a guinea pig for the rest of his life being sent, for example, to where? Rochester, New York? Um, in the, the, the experiment had two parts. Um, in the 70s, uh, the, the, uh, pro the, 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 in the 70s, a second generation of atomic scientists rediscovered this experiment. And so they wanted to dig up all the people who were dead who had been injected with plutonium. And they also wanted to bring whoever survived back into the lab for further studies. And Elmer was one of the people they brought back into the lab for further studies. Under what pretext, since he didn't know, supposedly, that he was a U.S. government guinea pig? He, they told Elmer, and this is all documented in the medical records, um, that, they, that they knew he had had a very serious cancer, and they wanted to know why he had lived so long. Huh. Eileen Wilson is our guest, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter. Unearthed the names of 18 people injected with plutonium by the U.S. government. When we come back, 
we're going to talk about uh, who these scientists were. We'll hear more of the stories. And then also the group studies, uh, the studies of hundreds of people who were given, um, well, a couple dozen disabled children in Massachusetts, fed radioactive isotopes in their oatmeal, pregnant women, hundreds of them also um, uh, served uh, so-called vitamin cocktails containing radioactive iron. How this all happened without anyone knowing about it until recently. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. As we continue looking at the plutonium files, America's secret medical experiments in the Cold War, we're broadcasting from Boulder, Colorado. Our guest, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Eileen Wilson, now lives in Denver. Um, the lessons, let the lessons of history remind us all that the best safeguard for the future is an informed, informed and active citizenry. Um, Let's continue on this journey of the people who were injected and the people who injected them. You know, this certainly sounds a little like the Tuskegee experiments. But tell us, who ran this program? Um, the program started uh, in the Manhattan Project. That was the project to build the atomic bomb in the early 40s. Um, side by side with the physicists, worked a group of doctors who were interested in finding out how to protect their own workers in the weapons complex and also trying to figure out what these new radioisotopes did in the human body. So uh, basically the beginning uh, was the, uh, the Fathers of the Bomb Project, the medical doctors and scientists that were the tier below the Nobel laureates, below the Oppenheimers, below the Fermis, and so on. And did those guys, though, the Fermis and the Oppenheimers, know this was happening? Uh, certainly the records indicate that Oppenheimer approved uh, the injections of these patients with plutonium because uh, Los Alamos at that time was fighting a severe contamination problem, and the scientists who were working in, that, in those laboratories were concerned about their own health. It's interesting. Didn't Oppenheimer come from Berkeley? And you had Elmer Allen, who was injected in California. That's correct. Uh, there was a large component, component excuse me, of the atomic bomb project in the Bay Area. Conducted where? At the University of California at Berkeley and also at University of California, San Francisco. So we're talking about a nexus of university, military, working together. Um, ex that's exactly right. Um, in, during the Manhattan Project, it was a very strange hybrid animal where you had uh, people that were in the military, uh, working for the military, and you had people that were getting paid by universities. The robbing of graves? Um, that occurred, well, um, that, I, I don't know if I would quite put it so strongly as that, but um, they did uh, exhume bodies. Um, these With the family's consent of dead people? Um, they, they sought the consent of the families, but they did not tell the families the true purpose 
for the exhumations. What did they tell them? Um, that they had been given some radioisotope or some chemical, and they wanted to see what it had done in the, in the bodies of their loved ones. Well, that's true, isn't it? Yes, but they did not use the word plutonium. Ah, uh-huh. Um, so can you name a scientist, and can you tell us um, what the response has been? Um, when I did my research, most of the scientists, with the exception of Heimer Fr Friedel, who was the assistant medical director of the Manhattan Project, uh, was dead. Um, the Manhattan the Project being the name of the, the, the atomic program bomb. that had developed the atomic bomb. But the scientists who had conducted the more recent studies defended them, that they were important to um, uh, uh, protecting the workers in the nuclear weapons complex, or that they were harmless. Mm -hmm. So let's go through the experiments. Um, the 18 people injected with plutonium, none of them knew that that had happened to them. But um, moving on, in a Massachusetts school, the Fernald School, 73 disabled children spoon-fed oatmeal that had radio, radio isotopes in them, radioactive isotopes. What happened? Uh, in that case, uh, this was a nutrition study, and they were given uh, radioactive calcium and other uh, radioisotopes. Every morning? In their, in their oatmeal. It was either mixed into the oatmeal or in the milk. And these boys did not know uh, what was being given to them, nor did their parents. And in fact, they were told that uh, this was really something nutritious and good for them. Um, they were asked to give uh, blood samples, urine samples, feces samples. Um, How and long did this go on for? It went on for a number of years, and these 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 boys grew into men and did not find out what had been done to them till the 90s. Upstate New York Hospital, 18-year-old girl thinks she is being treated for a pituitary disorder. Gets injected with plutonium. Um, this is a this was a young woman who, again, like Elmer Allen. Uh, wound up in the hospital in a hospital at the wrong place and at the wrong time, and was injected. Tennessee Clinic: 829 pregnant women served radioactive iron as part of their regular treatment. What did they think they were getting? This was a this was a study done immediately after World War II, and these young women came to the clinic thinking that they were getting vitamins to drink, that this would help their babies. And in fact, what was being studied was how fast the radioiodine crossed into the placenta. And where was this? This was at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And who was in charge? Uh, there were a group of scientists from Vanderbilt University. And what happened to these women? Um, there were, they had all kinds of ailments, skin diseases, cancer, blood disorders, um, some of their offspring, their children that, w that, that they were carrying at the time of this experiment died of cancer and very strange cancers at very young ages. Were there any whistleblowers among the doctors or nurses and the nurses now? There was no whistleblowers whatsoever. Uh, the doctors uh, closed ranks and considered this uh, worthwhile science and something they were doing uh, to protect the country. What about patients who were brought in the basement of a hospital and experimented on in the middle of the night? Where was this? This was an experiment that was done in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was another one of these hybrid exper experiments that was half medical, half military. And in many cases, these, that, that's the problem with hy hybrid experiments, is that um, oftentimes what's medically good for the patient is not militarily the best experiment. So uh, these studies were done with cancer patients. Uh, they were told it would help their cancer. Uh, what the doctors were looking at uh, was trying to figure out in the event of an atomic bomb detonation, how long could soldiers fight? We're talking to Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Eileen Wilson. Her uh, series came out in the Albuquerque Tribune and she turned it into a book, The Plutonium Files. Um, your expose uh, came out 
under the Clinton years. President Clinton set up an advisory committee on human radiation experiments, which did its own digging into hundreds of federally sponsored human radiation programs. Um, remarkably enough, the report, the final report, came out on October 3rd, 95, the same day as the verdict in the O.J. Simpson case. I don't remember seeing uh, the, the report results reported, any attention being paid to them. It, it was um, it was really unfortunate because um, everybody in the country was focused on O.J. Simpson and no or was it timed exactly right because let's remember every day people were waiting for the O.J. Simpson verdict so it clearly was not beyond um, the government commission uh, to understand the attention of the nation was focused elsewhere. Um, I hadn't thought about that, Amy. I mean, it's certainly a possibility. Um, you know, so the results came out anyway. The, the results came out anyway, and um, and nobody paid attention to it. And what were the results? Basically, they um, they confirmed that um, thousands and thousands of experiments had been done on U.S. citizens, that uh, the victims were the most vulnerable people in our society, the young, the disenfranchised, the poor, people of color, people who did not know enough to ask questions. In other words, the subjects were not doctor's children or friends of their doctors. They were people who were vulnerable. In how many places in the United States? Fernald School in Massachusetts, the Cincinnati tests, uh, Elmer Allen was at University of California, Berkeley. Um, how many sites were these government scientists working in? They, they, there were hundreds of sites. They were private hospitals, public hospitals, um, military installations, uh, orphanages, about any place that a doctor was working where they might be able to get a grant and do a paper. They were using these substances. Prison. Uh, yes, that was a really, really ugly experiment. Uh, uh, a group of prisoners had their testicles irradiated. Where? Uh, in Oregon, mostly. Uh, and the purpose of it was for NASA. They were interested in knowing the effects of um, space radiation on astronauts. And what happened to these prisoners? Uh, the, many of the prisoners that I interviewed were still in prison. Uh, they had all kinds of, of medical problems and cancers and health issues. Lawsuits? Many, many, many lawsuits filed. Uh, some of the families were compensated. Uh, the plutonium patients got an average per family of $400,000. I think that was the largest. And their patients at other sites around the country got lesser amounts. Mm -hmm. um, what about today? Do you think we have learned anything? And as people listen to this, I'm sure there are many who will start to wonder. I think, uh, I think that the, the way to safeguard yourself you as a patient or your loved ones as patients is by asking questions and the other way to safeguard the other way to prevent these things from happening again is to make sure that what we do is open and available to the public because openness is a disinfectant and it keeps these kind of malignant, unethical experiments from happening. And yet we have entered an age of perhaps greater sec secrecy than ever before. That's correct. I, in fact, I realized as I was doing my book, my intuition told me this was a small window that was closing, and I don't think that today I could get some of the documents that I was able to get for this book. Soldiers? Soldiers, thousands of, uh, thousands of soldiers were used uh, in bomb tests in Nevada. How? Well, they were, they were ordered into the blast area within minutes after detonation. Uh, they flew in, uh, uh, Air Force pilots flew into radioactive clouds. 
Uh, they detonated atomic bombs in the Pacific. Uh, the soldiers and sailors were then ordered in to retrieve um, uh, various uh, uh, instruments that were contaminated. And then there were not the people who were personally fed the radioisotopes, the kids at the Fernald School, or the women who were given these so-called vitamin cocktails that were actually radioactive, but there was the dispersing of radioactivity in the air, over cities, at schools. That's correct. Um, they, there were uh, there, one of the most famous is the Green Run uh, at the Hanford Reservation, in which they uh, in Washington State in Washington State, in which they released radioiodine, um, and the prairie was very hot. Um, but that was one of the controversial findings in this committee report. They did not say or recommend that the government be forbidden from doing these kinds of things. They basically said. Uh, y you need to have a committee, and at some point the documents should be made public. I, I, th I thought that was, was one of the worst recommendations that they came out with. I want to thank you, Eileen Wilson, very much for being with us. What was the biggest revelation for you in doing this research and looking at the plutonium files? Uh, uh, the biggest revelation for me was to see how cruel and inhuman these very educated doctors were toward their patients. And not telling them. And not telling them. And the medical establishment today, is it backing them up? Um, they were, when I was doing my research on this book, they still uh, defended these experiments as being important. Well, Eileen Wilson, thanks for being with us. The book is called The Plutonium Files, America's Secret Medical Experiments in the Cold War. Tomorrow on Democracy Now! we'll be joined.